This is Vern Benham Grimsley on campus. All the love in the world can be contained inside a small paper sack. And oh, really? You can fill the whole world. Like when one request, one request. Okay. Don't break that paper sack. Okay. Right. <laughs> when you're inside your mother, man, all you know is love. Yeah. See, and then you don't even have to think. Food comes when you want it. And when you're born, after you're born, mom has to say, don't cross the street or you might get hit by a car, you know? And that that's when hate starts getting programmed. So all the hate is just... Is just a program thing, and you can tear that down like you can blow up a computer. But you wouldn't it be possible that the mother saying to the child, "Don't cross the street against the traffic," you may get hit by a car. Is in fact doing that out of love and instead of out of hate. Right. <laughs> um, dig it. Like the Bible and all the trips that are laid down in the Bible. I read the front of the Bible, and it says translated by King James or some dude like that. And like what the trip is is like it was probably invented by a government to keep their people in line. You know. You know. think God is an invention of. God? government you say? yeah i really think so and like you know like god is a crutch for a lot of people not a pogo stick man it's a righteous crutch you know like um you need your what if a person is lame and limping does he need a crutch are you saying that crutches have no value um it all depends it all depends for another thing let me say even where there are no governments in some of the earliest tribal structures and pre-tribal structures among the aborigines of australia for example if there is religion and belief in god so how could you say it was set up by the government if people who have no governments still believe in god that's cool <laughs> yeah i can dig that but uh in other words i think there's a spiritual need in man it is my conviction that all this planet is one family that all men are sons of god all men are brothers and that that's the ideal for the planet living together as one family would you agree with that uh no why would you not agree with that? Because I don't, I don't believe in it that there's any kind of order to anything. That uh, the fact that anything exists is, is, is a freaking accident that I exist. You say that there's no kind of order. What about, for example, in the physics laboratories here on the University of California campus, where they discover an incredible order to laws of magnetism, of gravity, of what? That's an accident. And the way... I'm not saying I'm right. Uh -huh. I'm just t telling how I feel. The way electrons whirl around the nucleus of an atom is it all an accident, you would say. Yeah, that's very nice. That it happen. And the way the planets whirl around the sun in the system is an accident, you'd say? That's the only way it could happen. And the way photosynthesis is taking place in these leaves on the trees here on the campus would be an accident. That's the only way it could happen. There wouldn't possibly be another way that it could happen... <laughs> I think that there is another way that it could happen. I believe that the universe is intelligible and that God created it all. Well, I used to be strung out on smack. And you used to be on heroin, in other words. Yes. For how long a period of time were you on heroin? I shot it every day for a year. How much was that habit costing you? How expensive was it at that time? Well, it ran as high as $50 a day, and and I have burned people, ripped them off. I have been in knife fights. Uh, I've Winning or losing? Some I won and some I lost. <laughs> as a smile, now I could see some teeth missing. It nearly cost me my life. Uh, I got so bad into burning and ripping off that uh, people were out to kill me for it. Then you found God, and this changed your life? Uh... I was in Mendocino Hospital for my third time, and uh, I was when I was released, the very same day I was released, I, I thought back to the other two times I was released, and I, re and I flashed on what the doctor said, what the psych said. He told me that uh, if I wanted a kick, I'd have to stay up there at least a year, and even after that time, the, they weren't sure that I'd you know, be off of it or not. And uh, as soon as I, as soon as I came out, I sold my bus ticket. They gave me a bus ticket to go to San Francisco, and I had some money. And I was thinking of going back into the city my third time and, and fixing that same day I got out of the hospital, which I had done the previous two times I was released. Taking a shot of heroin the very first time. Right, same day I got out of the hospital. And I knew I was going to do it. And I stood on a highway, and, and I st and I then I start started doing some soul searching because I've had it. I've had it enough, you know. I had it up as far as I can take it. You probably almost felt as if you were searching for your soul, didn't you? Doing the soul searching that you did at that point. 
Yeah, I was searching for something to rescue me, and I and I and it was a comforting thought to know that I don't have to straighten out to come to God, but He can take me just as I am and come into my life exactly as you were. And and I, and well, you know, I used to think, well, in order to meet God, I'd have to uh, clean up first, and I'd have to uh, get my head straight and <clears throat> and get all these th th thoughts out of my head and all. Uh, about ripping off and burning and perch snatching and whatever, <laughs> yeah. but it's not true. He, he, just all. He don't care what's in your head. God doesn't care what's in your mind. He doesn't care what you look like. He sees you inside. He, he, he wants to know if you're searching. If you want the truth. If you want to change your way of life if you want to come to the truth and to the light that's what he's interested in he's interested in this questing and hungering of your heart whether you're hungry for god you are again thinking too shallowly i could take i could take pots of paint and pick them up and field throw them against a canvas and i might wind up with a picture that looked good now it's sheer accident the way it happened, but you still might come up with a picture. You could conceivably throw them up enough so that you had a, a, a nice little picture with houses and people and everything. And you're saying now, that everything chances, in all the universe is that way. The chances are a billion, billion, billion to one that uh, the universe would get together accidentally just the way it has, but obviously that chance came through. We're here. We wouldn't let me be tell here you, if that Let happened. me tell you a true story. One time... Henry Ward Beecher, right. the Somebody preacher back in right. Civil War days, was visited by the skeptic Ingersoll. <laughs> he was visiting in Beecher's den in his study, and he noticed a very well-done globe Relax, in hiding. Henry Ward Beecher's study, crafted in Europe and so forth. Ingersoll walked over to it, gave this globe a spin, turned to Henry Ward Beecher, and admiring it, he said, very well done. Who made this? Beecher said, oh, nobody made it. It just happened. <laughs> what Ingersoll was recognizing was that that particular globe did not simply collide itself together by all its atoms and molecules and form itself. It was made. Oh. And in the same way, the universe itself, I would say, appears too orderly to have just fallen together. I believe God right. created it. A person can communicate with God. Now, there's another aspect of it. Prayer would be meaningless if you had a God who was impersonal. You can communicate to a dog, too. Communicate? Yes. You, you can say, sit, and you'll sit, and things like that, you know. Yeah. And and a, a, a dog, if he's hungry, can come up and bake, and you know what he's saying. I mean, but, uh, you know, this is another reason why, you know, God is not a personal thing. He, he is, well... But let me say this so about above that. He, he, he's so above that, so infinite, that, that to, to bring him down to a merely human level is um, blasphemy. Oh, well, I'm saying, first of all, I'm saying that God must have at least as much personality as we have. I'm not limiting God's personality to ours. As a matter of fact, I'm sure God has infinitely much more than what we consider to be personality. But I think he has to have at least that much because personality is the highest that we know in other human beings. For another thing, the relationship between a man and his dog takes place on what biologists and zoologists consider to be a partially instinctive level, partially one of conditioned or trained responses, and not the high level of abstract communication. You can indeed determine whether your dog is hungry, and you can indeed teach him to sit up and beg or roll over. But I defy you to discuss Plato's Republic or the 55th chapter of Isaiah with your <laughs> househound. So this is what I mean by the realms of communication. Did that strike home? But yeah, but yeah, that, that strikes home in general. Jesus was talking about fulfilling the spirit of the Old Testament well, and not the letter. He didn't say that. Well, he did say on several... Every chittle shall be fulfilled. <laughs> he did say on several occasions that you've heard it was said in the old days, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. He said, I say to you instead, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, pray for those who despitefully use you. Time and again, he went beyond the old negativism with a new positivism. Let me give you an example. Let me give you a test. In five... What did you say? Yes. Now that the fanfare is out of the way, ladies and gentlemen, let me give you a test. For the next five seconds, try not to think of a turtle. Can you do it? Can you? 
quite easily. I was just thinking of a rabbit instead. I was thinking instead of what? Oh, the point is that somewhere on some level of your consciousness, you have to be aware that a turtle is what you're trying not to think about. No, I wasn't. I decided I wanted to think about a rabbit, and I thought about a rabbit so to the exclusion of anything else in the universe. So but the rabbit was... With a new positivism. <laughs> yes. So I replaced the old negativism with a new positivism. And besides, the rabbit you were thinking about was racing a turtle, right? <laughs> I've heard that story before. The point is, if you say to a child, don't think of a hippopotamus, the child has to remember That's in his mind... You're an undeveloped child, yes. But to someone who's grown up and knows how to control his own mind, he has no trouble at all thinking about something else. This is a very important principle. If you have to hold a positive in order to drive out a negative, then to hold love for other human beings and to hold the positive principles of love for God and man is higher than the simple making of a long list of things a person ought not to do. A series of negative commandments. And that's why Jesus was teaching positive commandments instead of negative ones. Do you believe God is your father and you're a son of his and every person on this planet is a brother? Sure. Sure. I really believe that. Um, I don't know how to, how to put it in words, but I can... I mean, you know, I can just... Uh, I feel it, you know. See, in this... Uh, Really, I, I, you know, I just can't explain it. You know, I, I got it all inside of me. You know, what I just, right now, it just won't come out. Yeah. That's what's going to change this world, I believe. Here you and I are standing on this Berkeley campus. You're a black man and I'm a white man. And yet I believe we have one Father God and we're brothers. And I believe that can change this world if people love each other that way. You think so? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah. I wish the, all of the people felt that way, you know. Um, it would be... Tremendous if everybody just came into one, you know, and, 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 and had that belief. Began living as the family of God. Right, 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 right. Um, out in the open, the flowers that you have in your garden, he said, they belong to, to, uh, to God. And say, people, humor is the same way. They are flowers of God. All of them is one. And all different colors, still. Definitely, definitely. Right, right. That's great. I believe all different colors are sons and daughters of God and brothers in one family. And if people can turn to God with all their hearts and begin to live with this new love, then the world is going to be transformed. I believe that. Do you? Yeah, I believe so, too. I do, too. It appears to me we can only have peace on earth and goodwill among men if we have peace and goodwill literally in the lives of people. If other people want. Yeah, of course. You have to feel it in your heart first before you can go out and make it a reality for yourself and for everyone else. But what happens on the day when a person gets up on the wrong side of the bed and doesn't want to love and serve and be a brother? It's at that point, I think, that prayer, that meditation, that worship, that somehow having a link with spiritual energies in one's own life makes a great difference. Yeah, of course. Really. I think so. I'm from Sweden, otherwise, so... How long have you been in this country from Sweden? Uh, one month, a little more, and I'm traveling around by myself in this country, and I've talked to a lot of people here. Yeah. I recall reading the statistic that in Sweden, average attendance at Sunday worship services is about 3% nationally, very small. Is that correct? I should think, yes, yeah. that's correct. But uh, I can't condemn anybody if they have an individual religion. I think everybody has a little kind of individual religion. Because, for example, when we have the Bible, I mean, I can't say for myself that I can believe everything in the Bible. Oh. But I, I hope I can say that I'm a Christian. I hope. Yeah. But, you know, I, I can't say that I believe in just everything and that I understand in everything. I believe in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, that all human yeah. beings on this planet... Yeah, I, I do the same, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that all human beings on this planet are members in the family of God? Yeah. It's good to be in a void, just sort of drifting, I think, for a while. It's good to be in a void? You mean not believing anything? Maybe for a while, if you, if you had a belief that you were you were given a belief ever since you could remember. I have to believe that it's good to be in a void for a while because that's what I'm in. <laughs> because that way you're not under any inward pressure, you mean, to behave in a certain way? Right. It's good to, like, rebel. Well, I feel like I have to rebel against everything I was taught now. That means believing nothing, if necessary. Including rebelling against the religion you were taught? Especially. Why especially the religion? Well, because 
Well, religion, I always thought, is the most important part of your life. I mean, if there's a God, then your whole life should revolve around God. In the same way that the world revolves around the sun, a person's life should revolve around God? Well, world and sun and everything would revolve around God, or else wouldn't revolve, it would be God. It would, you know, all of it. You think that religion demands a complete commitment of a person. It's not just something that a person ought to take very lightly. Of course not. It should be. Which is why it's difficult to have a religion. <laughs> I mean, you know, you just sort of believe in particular, you know, well, nothing in particular, you just sort of have this general feeling. Maybe not put into a form, maybe not call it a religion. God is a God of supreme loyalties. I very strongly believe that. An elephant can have fleas, for example, but a flea cannot have elephants. In the same way, every world religion can have some truth, although no one religion, I think, possesses all that there is because human beings have helped write some of the materials of it. It's been interpreted, it's been creedalized and catechized down through the century. So Jesus saying to seek the truth, I think, was to say a beautiful and an adventure. You know, the Bible says that man was created in God's image, and I'm one of these people who believes actually God was created in man's image. But They're saying that man created God. Um, at least man has created forms of God. I'm, don't, don't, don't go on to say that they created each other. I'm going to get lost in this. <laughs> well, okay, the point I would be making then is you know, that I think there are many times when man has created God, but this does not mean that God does not exist on his own. I mean, man has created his own concept of God. I'm sure he's relieved to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he is, yes. A great divine sigh swept through the entire universe, as you said. Well, God might exist on his own. <laughs> it took a great strain off his mind. <laughs> my point being is that the self, I, I, I've heard this, you know, many times before, even on your broadcast, that when people are discussing God, they have to be metaphorical. And that the metaphor for God is usually a personal thing. I mean, in even Greek theology, that you know, the gods are human beings. Yeah, but I think that it's more than just a poetic reason that it's handy linguistically to refer to God as a father. I also believe the highest realities of human life are personal realities. I mean that. Friendship, fellowship, and love. These can only be had between personalities. Would you agree that friendship, fellowship, and love can only be had between personalities? Well, personalities as we know it, or friendships and love as we know it. Well, what I mean is two stones, two cauliflower, or a mushroom and a kumquat next to each other on the ground do not generally share what we would consider to be friendship and love and fellowship. They just don't relate. Yeah, yes, okay, well, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying, that these highest things are personal realities. Therefore, if we deny personality to God, if we say God is not personal, then we're denying to God the best things we know, which is rather strange because if your concept of God is that he is the perfect, all-inclusive, supreme being, to deny him the best that we know on earth is even philosophically and logically strange, much less to say spiritually strange, which I think it is. So that's why I believe God is a personal being, in addition to the fact that I was talking with him. Can Christians be lunatics? What did you say? Can Christians be lunatics? Because there are many here on this campus who claim to be Christians or who are most undoubtedly lunatics. And is there any connection between the two? You mean, is one necessarily the other, in the same way that a rose is a flower? Uh, yes. <laughs> all roses are flowers, but not all flowers are roses, right? True. That's known as syllogistic logic. Therefore, not all, <laughs> not all Christians by any means are demented. As a matter of fact, to see every other human being as an infinitely valuable person, not just as someone socially and economically expendable, but as a brother, a member in the family of God, regardless of his skin color, regardless of his dialect, regardless of where his parents came from or where he was reared, culturally, economically, sociologically, to see that person as infinitely valuable as a son of God. I think that is basic to the real kind of freedom this planet is seeking, a freedom which transcends the institutions of it, but which is a spiritual freedom of man finding God, finding why he's alive, his purpose in life. Yes, I agree with you. Well, I don't know what you mean by God, you know. I mean, everything that's living, I feel, is God. What do you think about a creator of the universe? Well, I don't know about some man up in the heaven with a big beard sitting on a throne saying, well, I'm going to create this and create that. I don't know, you know. If there is, you know, I'd like to meet him. 
<laughs> if a person defines God as an old man sitting on a cloud, I would have to be an atheist myself, because I don't think there's an old man sitting on a cloud up there. I think God is infinite and everywhere. I think the old man on the cloud idea is too small an idea of God. Would that seem right to you? Yeah, that seems right. I think it, the definition of God to me would be uh, of life. <laughs> flowing within all of us. I believe all human beings on this earth are sons and daughters of God, and all human beings are brothers in one family. Yeah, there are people who understand and know, uh, believe, and are at a certain level of consciousness or whatever you want to call of, There are a lot of people that are on a power thing, which make them, you know, forget the idea of God, of life, of the, the better things in life, the simple things in life that are what makes life up. You know? The simple things, I think, are spiritual things. Love, for example, is not just a physical thing, and beauty is not just physical, and goodness. That's just the first step, you know. There's so many, there's so many levels beyond that that it's, uh, you know, you can go on and on. And uh, You think love is a spiritual reality, in a sense, then? Most definitely. Yeah. Most definitely. That's why I think it makes a great deal of sense to say God is love, that God is not just... That's right. That's right. Man has been in a, in a dream state, and uh, dreams are very healthy. Uh, however, when you wake up, then you have the responsibility and the burden of uh, uh, comprehending those dreams. I think, as you said earlier, we're going through a renaissance, but uh, I am very, very um, disillusioned that man, uh, the responsible hierarchy, recognizes man's overall need for a, uh, a spiritual foundation. I believe that this can come about, though. I believe the spiritual renaissance is beginning in individual lives and will then permeate the planet. It's uh, overwhelming. Do you think all men are children of God and brothers on this earth? Positively, yes. I was reading one psychologist just the other day who was saying that Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. And the fact psychologically is that you will also hate your neighbor as yourself if, in fact, you hate yourself. That your own attitude, your own assessment of who you are, whether you're valuable or not, is always extended and projected toward other people. So that if a person sees himself to be a son or daughter of God, that he's able then to love other people. In a I, I think... What you like to call the, the spiritual renaissance of nowadays is something entirely different, at least it seems to me, is something entirely different than um, a, a re, an, inter, an inner realization of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. I'm right. saying I think that's what's needed. I think no. it's just beginning to dawn, well, think, not no. perhaps among too many people, but it is beginning uh, to happen. I, I think what is happening on the contrary is sort of the what I like to call sort of a cosmic cop-out. It's the religious groups that are springing, springing up are either extremely messianic who are saying forget, a, forget about all of it, just dance around, you know, singing your head off. And frankly, I don't think, I don't think that does, well, perhaps that does them some good, helps them forget about their cares. But Vern, can you, do, you, do, you think it's, do you think that's really enough for a person just to sit around and forget about his cares? and be cosmically happy and forget about everyone else. I don't think it is, really. Well, if that's all a person's religion consisted of, certainly that wouldn't be enough. The problem has been that historically, in terms of religion, people have taken either the fatherhood of God or the brotherhood of man and have isolated either the fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man. If you have only the fatherhood of God, you have the individual person sitting in his closet and meditating or praying or something and never getting out into the world. If you have only the brotherhood of man, one may develop an exalted humanism, a philanthropy, a concern in general for the social welfare of others, but there's not the power, the divine spiritual power a person needs in his life to be able to do it. It's only, I think, when you join these two together and a person is first, as an individual, transformed, that he is able to march out and change the world, to be a different person in a world which vitally, crucially, urgently needs. Why, you know, is... <laughs> Why is what? Why is there all kinds of problems in that? I mean, like, you know, tear gas and all that, and, you know, the law against drugs and all that. Who, who made that law that you can't or you can, you know? I mean, it was man's will, but it, I mean, it was also God's will to grow it and be able to make it, you know? It's really amazing. That's I think the point is that God has given us a world in which there are all manner of things. We can mine metals from the earth. We can harvest crops, 
from the land. Man has the same choice, this God-given choice, before him in his very life itself, whether he's going to use his possibilities and potentials for good or for evil. And that's why it's important, I think, to seek for the will of God, really to pray, really to ask for God's direction and guidance. I believe it's the happiest, most joyous way possible to live. But he really has an infinite, almost blinding love for his sons and daughters, and that's what we are. Yeah. <laughs> Does that make some sense to you? Yes, yeah, some now. The way I think that everyone has a lot of religion. I, if I understand what you mean by religion, they just refuse to acknowledge it or try to. Cover People it. have religion but don't acknowledge it. In other words, they have a yearning for God, if you want to call it God, but they refuse. They either uh, gloss it over or put a lot of camouflage out there to. You do want to call it God? What'd you say? I'll, I'll be the first to admit that the overwhelming majority of people need crutches, but uh, that is not the same thing as to admit that those who are healthy should be forced to use the same invalids use. You're saying that religion is a crutch? Uh, for most people, yes. In my judgment, religion may begin as a crutch, but I see some people later using it as a walking staff and finally doing pole vaulting with it <laughs> to the extent that it really becomes an addition to power. I would imagine that I've seen only one or two people in my life using it as a pole vault. Most are still hobbling along using it as a crutch. If it's a crutch, then, then God came to this earth to help man because there was an epidemic of broken legs that infects everyone. One of the problems is that a good many people, I think, don't really have a sense of who and what they are, as psychology calls it, an identity crisis, and that a person lives out his own concept of his own identity. So if he conceives of himself as a son or daughter of the living God, as a member in one vast family of God, if he sees himself as a brother to mankind... If you can have the, uh, this right relationship w between your mind and other people's minds, and if you can have the, a life with meaning and fulfillment without having the labels attached to it. What's wrong with that? If you can have it without the labels of God, you mean attached to it, and religion? All the, all the religious terms and, and everything else. Let me say this. I think that the labels a person attaches to religion are very secondary. The important thing is the experience, and I really agree with you on this. For example, in Spanish, the word for bread is pan, and in English, the word for pan is bread. <laughs> the word for bread is bread. The important thing is not the terminology linguistically a person gives to it. The fact is that you can eat this stuff and be nourished by it. In the same way, man can be nourished by love and by faith and can be nourished by prayer, for example, if he calls it meditation, if he calls it by some other name. The important thing is that man recognize the spiritual dimension to life. Okay, you say God is love. Well, I say love is love. You know, Love is love? <laughs> Yeah. I can't argue with that. <laughs> I, I mean, just, that is logically impeccable. Yes, love is love, right? <laughs> if you believe in love, you don't have to believe in God. You know. Are you we don't... on candy camera? No, you're on a radio broadcast. Uh, the people listening to me now. I don't see any bad. What about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man? Believing that all people are sons of God and all men are brothers on this earth. Well, that's your bag, you know. To me, I'm I'm just here, you know. I don't think God put me here. You don't think God put you here? No. You can have some of it. No, I don't, believe, I don't believe in a God, really. No offense. I believe God believes in you. I believe God believes you're a son of his. Well, see, if he won't believe in me, that's his problem. But see, I don't believe in him. Well, well, have... The interesting thing is I think I have a higher opinion of you maybe than you have of yourself because I believe you're there's a son of There's a search for religion. I think there's a disillusionment with the church. And I think people who are going out and sort of trying to find themselves by themselves, sort of existentialistic. And I think a lot of people are coming back to religion. I think that's a very vital thing if it's not just institutionalized. I think the important thing is the finding of the experience. The riverbed is not the river, and neither is the vital flowing stream of spiritual life equivalent to the institutions in which mankind has put it. Well, I agree with you that uh, the institutions can often be a, an obstacle to real religious experience. On the other hand, do you think that we can carry this individualism to its final you know, extent? In other words, saying that the individual alone can make up his mind about the nature of God and the nature of his relationship to God. I think it begins on an individual level, but it finally has to have social repercussions. You bring up a very good point. If a person just believes, for example, in the fatherhood of God, he can sit off in a cave in a mountainside somewhere and just be mystical all day long. But if he believes in the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, if he believes he's also living in a family and every other human being, black, white, red, and yellow, and every hue and shade between is a brother of his and needs to be treated that way, if he joins the fatherhood of God and brotherhood of man together, he has a vital and, I believe, a life-changing and a world-changing religion. 
That's when true. you're driving down the freeway 10 miles over the speed limit between two diesel semis and behind a moving van on a rainy midnight with your seat belt unbuckled and no tread on the tires, and all of a sudden the rear door of the moving van come flying open and a grand piano with a four-poster bed strapped to it comes rolling out on the freeway. It's at a time like that the average person learns to pray. <laughs> Go ahead. It's, it's a time, truth. It's at a time like that that the that average person, person dies. dies. Yeah, right. <laughs> However, it, should you have a little bit more time at your disposal, you might want to try what Jesus said. Go into your closet, close the door, the and do it. The when I hear a preacher, I pray that they go away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, either it's there or it's not, and all the rituals and all of the things you're going to do aren't going to change it. And in fact, I believe that it's always there. And what you've got to do is find it and ex exploit it to the, the greatest degree. If a man had oil or gold in his backyard, and all the geological engineers on Earth knew it, they could all come parading up to his front door with attaché cases in their hands and with maps and with demonstrations that there was, shall we say, oil or gold on his land. But if the man chose not to believe it, he could go on living on a hovel and on a bare sustenance existence by the sheer refusal to believe something that good that he already had in his possession. And that's the state, that's the condition of most people on this planet right now, I think. They don't believe because they almost adamantly refuse to believe that anything that good could be true. That man could be a child of God, infinitely loved, with a spark of divinity. Right, you, so, so, your, so your faith is, so you courageously and heroically, uh, you, know, uh, you know, choose to assume that uh, there is life after death. I must admit that that is a courageous and heroic assumption. But, uh, thank I you. <laughs> it takes that much courage to put yourself that far out on a limb. But what? Uh, but what I want to say. And then here you come with a saw. Go ahead. Right, here, I, here I come with a saw. It's a, I think. It, I, oh, why? Why can't you just live? Live now. We know we're alive now. Why don't we live now and let and let death take care of itself? That thing is. That's what I'm. Doing. I am as sure that I'm going to live after my death as I am sure that I'm alive now. Vern, I want to tell you, you something. What? Vern, you can't be. <laughs> because you, you have just said we can have no knowledge of life after death. And I'm but faith that too. All empirical methods break down about such things. As what I'm saying is. is that faith itself is a state of knowledge. When Kathleen Norris, the San Francisco novelist, died, someone went back and found a 1924 edition of Vanity Fair magazine. The editor of that magazine had requested famous Americans to write their own epitaphs. I happen to remember the one that Kathleen Norris wrote. This model mother, sister, wife believed through all her joys and woes that life is death and death is life, and now she knows. And that's on her tombstone. I believe Yeah, that. God loves man, but he sure must not like man very much, because look at all the things he lets us do. Ah, oh, I think that's because God loves us very much. You mean such as warfare and rioting and all that? Warfare and getting clap and things like that. God loves us very much, and the very fact that we are free to do those things indicates that God loves us, because he's given us that freedom, and that's the greatest gift that God has given man, this freedom. How would you like not to be free? What if God came down and tied chains around your hands and your legs and made you do precisely what he wanted you to do, as if you were a mortal marionette and you had to dance when he whistled? I'd probably bite him in the leg and then run. Well, you wouldn't be very happy with it. You're much more happy knowing that you have freedom and you can make up your mind. Don't you think? Sure. <laughs> what would you say? Very good answer on her part. Uh, are we on radio? Yeah. Uh, well, I have uh, no feelings one way or the other towards religion. Well, it's a good opiate for the masses. Religion is an opiate for the masses? An opiate is a painkiller. People suffer a lot of pain for religion. No, they suffer a lot of pain because of religion. Religion mostly you? tells them that there's a good and an evil and that there's no continuum and that it's only their own neurosis that piles on. Is there is a good and an evil. Regardless of whether you believe in religion or not, there's a good and an evil. And the supreme decision of human life is to choose the good, me, the will of God. What? what do you think of religion, man? I think it's the most vital subject on Earth today. I believe this planet can live as one family, the family of God, all brothers. Sure. Yeah. You don't think if somebody's trying to pick a fight with you or, you know, start an argument with you, and you just agree with everything they say, they can't do anything else. You know, they just get madder and madder. But they're not getting mad at you, they're getting mad at themselves for being able to, you know, be fooled this way. When you refuse to become angry at another person, that instantly gives you the upper hand because you've refused to play his game, which is the anger game, which is the hatred game. Yeah. 
And the ideal, a dream that Jesus was talking about is that the whole world can stop playing the hatred game. That if the whole world would realize we're members in one family spiritually, we're brothers because we're all sons and daughters of God, and we're all infinitely loved, and then live this out, we could stop hating, and we could stop hurting, and we could stop killing and maiming and wishing ill to each other, and we could start living in a joyous world. Oh, I'd say it's probably relevant, but not to me. Religion is not relevant to you, you say? Right, that's what I say. I can't understand a lot of things that they say. It represents something down inside people, but I don't know whether it you know, has any uh, concrete meaning like the laws of physics or chemistry or something like oh, that. Oh, you're saying that people have an intuitive, innate kind of response to religious teachings, but you're not entirely sure whether they correspond to anything in the real world. Physical reality, <laughs> yeah. I think they don't correspond to physical reality, but to spiritual reality. I believe that... Can you take them apart, though? Can you, can you separate, can you say this is physical reality and this is spiritual? Can you take those two apart? I'll give an example. Take love. Now, a person with a physiological brain may love someone else, but can you say that the love itself is physiological and physical? What about truth and beauty and goodness? Are these strictly material things? No, they're symbols that we've dreamed up that are lodged somewhere down in the brain. Well, I would say that these are more than just intellectual realities. That love, no, truth, beauty, and goodness, they are emotional realities, too. I would say they're also spiritual like realities. Composed of what? Composed isn't of it, what? I, isn't it possible that all emotion and all feeling is composed of what you have been taught and what you learn through life and what people, you know, slap on your head and all this? Isn't that what the emotional feelings are all about? Something that feels love to another person could be a completely different emotion because of what he's been taught. However we feel it and the different ways people perceive love, the fact remains great men and women oftentimes will live their entire lives devoted to and motivated by love. The great men of whatever races, of whatever religions, this will be the highest motivation they have, the love of God and man fundamentally. So whatever words we want to call it by, however we want to describe it, I believe this is of God. This is a spiritual power. It's not just some sort of secretion of a gland in man, but that man is the son of God and can live this way, and this whole planet can be one family. Hi, do you have a question? Question about what? About God. Well, I used to think, is God a, a spiritual form, or can he materialize himself? <laughs> That's one of the best questions I've ever had on this game. How old are you? Nine. You're nine, and you want to know if God is spiritual? Well, if he can materialize himself, like, they, some people say you can't see God, he's just a spirit, but I don't know if spirits can materialize themselves. I believe God is like the wind. Jesus one time said God is like the wind in the trees. There's a little bit of wind out here on the Berkeley campus right now, and you can see the leaves in the trees rustling and the twigs rubbing against each other. I believe that God is invisible, but that he has power. Just as wind is invisible, wind has power to move the tree. Well, some people tell me that when the wind is blowing the trees, there's one God, and he's the, 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 there's, a man, there's a God. What do you think God is like? Well, uh, what I think he is, he's uh, conscious. He's like... Uh, a spiritualized conscience. That there's something of God inside every person. Yes. I believe there is, that there's a spark of the divine in every person. I believe there is in you. I believe you're a son of God. What do you think of that? Well, in a way I believe that, in a way I don't. Like, there's like our earthly father and a heavenly father, but you can't just say, well, I, Jesus made you. You can't just walk up and somebody say, Jesus made me, Jesus made me. You might say, ah, oh, baloney. See what? When somebody says, ah, oh, baloney, you make a baloney sandwich of it, okay? <laughs> well. And when somebody hands you a lemon, you make lemonade, okay? Well. <laughs> Well, lemonade and bologna sandwiches go pretty good together. <laughs> so don't let anybody make fun of your religion. If you believe you're a son of God and God loves you, don't let anybody talk you out of that, okay? Oh, do you need to, do you need to believe in a God to treat someone else as your brother? Do you really need this? I mean, what do they have? I mean, first of all, you go up and you talk about this, this what I consider to be this very abstract notion. Because Let me ask you this. Do you think the Brotherhood of Man is possible? Tell me what you positively think about it. Do I really think so? No. Why not? Uh, I think I think uh, people are uh, 
are just not will are not ever going to be willing to treat everyone else as brothers. We're too we're we're uh, we're a little too fighting. Maybe it's because we're reluctant to think of one God as being our father, and the planet as being a family. What do you think? About well, I don't know, but uh, the Christians have never been able to really do this. Take, for example, the Crusades. I mean, that showed a lot of love and affection toward the Muslims. You know, they wanted to treat them as brothers, but it never really worked. A distinction has to be made between the religion of Jesus and the religion about Jesus. That historically, we've done a lot of talking about, and there have been a lot of teachings about, about what Jesus taught. But what he himself was talking about was a relationship of love. He was talking about compassion, about turning the other cheek, about doing good to a person who does evil to you. You say, I see, you say, I see in man things that lend, you know, that he should, you know, things that transcend corporeal life. But how do you know that there's anything to transcend into? I mean, you, 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 still, have, you, you still haven't gotten around it. All right. A Psychologists are admitting the fact that the more they study human beings, get into such realms of creativity, of man's poetry, his art, his music, etc., that they're dealing with things that the ordinary rules of psychological explanation simply do not deal with, really. That there's something very much higher, very much different. Piaget, in his work, in observing children, has found that there comes a point at which they seem to make a spiritual transition in their early developmental their careers, yes. I and think I, this might be explained. What would you say? Another example is that is Langley Porter, the uh, UC Medical Institute, is um, doing research data on... on, on um, meditators on, for the religious um, uh, religious experience and another thing uh, uh, right here a graduate student I know in um, psychology is um, doing uh, his PhD to, um, thesis on um, religious experience professor Robert Elliott Hume of Columbia University has said that there has not been a culture a race nor a people anywhere on the earth who has not had some sort of religious experience some sort of theology Right. And I would agree with that, I that there's say. a spiritual consciousness within man because even man among, has... Even among the, atheists alone, in not believing there, there, there's, there's, um, there's, an element of, uh, there's an element of faith. So How do you mean that? that? Well, then, and they, they believe in not believing, they say. Hmm. It's, it's I been, just want yeah. proof. That if becomes can, a... Real... If can, if, Vern, if you can prove to me you're right, I'll believe you. <laughs> you understand, but it's beyond... I want, I want no, proof. It's beyond a subject, or, or, I mean, an objective... Proof I mean, of miracle thing. No, let me give you an example. What you're telling me is you have my no wife proof. loves me, uh -huh. but I could not conceivably get out a pen and ink and somehow, in a mathematical or Aristotelian syllogistic manner, prove that my All wife right, loves even me. Subje even a how could that I makes prove? Objective sense to me. How could I prove that that right. tree against that sky is beautiful as we're standing on campus right. looking at it? All right. It's simply subjectively known. It's recognized. It's something right. governed by your own particular criteria. Another fact I would base this all on, or another at least argument or distinction, would be the fact that human beings seem to have innately an ability to recognize goodness, truth, beauty, and love. No. Wait. Now, these are not Hold simply it. physiological phenomena. Hold these are spiritual. And it's because of this spirit within man, this divine gift of God, as Jesus said, the kingdom of God being within us, that we're able to... Would you to say that religion is psychologically schizophrenic when, for example, Jung, the psychiatrist, said that he'd never known anyone over the age of 35 to recover psychologically who had not regained a basically religious outlook toward life? And secondly, Alfred Adler, who studied in the early part of the 20th century with Freud in Vienna, said that the ultimate cure for man's neurosis, juvenile delinquency, and so forth would be the learning of neighborly love, which is essentially what Jesus was proclaiming 2,000 years ago. Well, I intend to write a book to set Young completely straight because I've lived through a, a range of these experiences that are fantastic. In other words, in seeking to do something with the effect, a man turns to what the content of his mind has. I would say one of the contents of man's mind is a spiritual fragment, a fragment of infinity, part of God. What do you think about the ideal of this planet living as a family, all people being children of God, all people being brothers in one family? Uh, you know, what should I think? I mean, you know, uh... <laughs> what do you think? Sounds all right to me, man. Sounds all right to you? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> whereas, whereas Jesus is referred to as the Son of God in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, uh -huh. he refers to himself as the Son of Man, which to me seems to negate the idea of a uh, supernatural being. Uh, would you comment on that? I think that Jesus was both the Son of God and the Son of Man, that Jesus was God incarnate, but that Jesus also was a human being in the sense that he hungered, he thirsted, he felt pain, he grew weary, and all the rest of this. And the Jesus message was that 
God is the father of all men and that all men are sons and daughters of God in the spiritual sense, that all men are brothers in one family, that this was the essence of his message. This has been Vern Benham Grimsley on campus. For free literature on the spiritual life, write to Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, USA.